Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Davenport. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Joomla 4 architecture. Um, first of all, I better tell you a little bit about me. Uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from Britain. Uh, and I'm actually from a little corner of England, uh, right next to the border with Wales, uh, roughly where that marker is. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, just recently there was a poll conducted uh, in the UK about what uh, Britain's favorite food was. Uh, it used to be fish and chips, uh, but uh, now actually it turns out to be uh, chicken curry. Um, so it's great to be here in India to actually uh, taste uh, the national dish of, in, uh, of, of England in its native environment. Um, so I actually started working with computers professionally in uh, 1980. I sort of played around with them before then, but professionally 1980. Um, and I began working with Mambo. I discovered Mambo in, in 2003 and started working with that. And uh, I was actually invited to join the, the Joomla core team in uh, 2006. And I've actually been in the uh, one or other of the leadership teams in the Joomla project ever since. So this is actually the, uh, the ninth year that I've actually been in the, in the leadership team. Uh, I'm currently uh, the release team leader for Joomla 3.6, uh, and I'll be saying uh, I've got a talk uh, on Sunday, I think, um, where I'll, I'll be going through Joomla 3.6 in more detail. Uh, and I'm also uh, a member of the architecture team for uh, Joomla 4, uh, which is, of course, what I'm going to talk about today. So, um, architecture. Now, everyone who talks about architecture inevitably puts in a slide with uh, a rather nice building in it um, because there, is, uh, there are some uh, resemblances, I suppose, between software architecture and, and architecture in the real world. Um, but I put this one in. Uh, well, I, I can't be any different. I must put one in. Um, but I thought I'd put this, this one in, in particular because uh, of, a, of a connection with, uh, with Joomla, a distant connection, admittedly. Um, the J and Beyond uh, event next year. Anybody going to the J and Beyond event, uh, event next year? Put your hands up. Uh, yeah, well done, Sandy. Yeah, a couple of people there. Right. Um, it's going to be held in Barcelona. And this building is actually in Barcelona. This is the, uh, the Casa Miller. Uh, and it was uh, designed by the, the architect um, uh, Gaudi. And uh, if, you're, if you do get to J and Beyond, and I thoroughly recommend that you do, it's a great developer event. Uh, then do actually take some time out, uh, maybe an extra few days here and there, if you can, uh, to go and look at the, the architecture around Barcelona, because it is actually wonderful. Uh, and I took this photograph actually uh, just about three weeks ago when I was there. Um, so let's talk about Joomla's architecture, which is probably much more interesting to you guys anyway. Um, I want to start by just taking a step back and taking a very high level view of, uh, of Joomla and its architecture. Probably not quite that high a level. Um, this is more like it. This, uh, so basically, Joomla is uh, like a federation of, of components, um, a collection of components. Uh, they're more or less coupled, hopefully less coupled. Um, but we have things like content and users and banners and stuff like that. They talk to one another occasionally. They share some stuff occasionally. Ideally, we would want them to be completely decoupled. And part of the, what we've uh, been doing over the past couple of years is to gradually remove that coupling between these components to have them more or less separate. So what we have, or what we would like to some degree, is that for each of these components to be kind of like silos. So they, they have limited uh, communication between them. Uh, and I'll talk some more in, uh, in my Joomla 3.6 session about how that communication, how we would want that communication to take place. Um, but right now, what we have, uh, and I think if you were in Marco's uh, talk this morning, he, he alluded to this, is that we have a lot of generic code, um, which particularly concerned with cross-cutting concerns within the, within the package, um, which is spread throughout various different components. And this often leads to duplication, and it leads to uh, coupling where we shouldn't have coupling. Uh, so one of the things we want to try and do for Joomla 4 is to separate that code out so that uh, it is in separate, distinct components into these horizontal components that we're, uh, as we're referring them to. Um, and the intention really is that 
the decoupling should be so successful that ultimately these horizontal <laughs> components should kind of disappear into the background. You shouldn't need to really be concerned that they're even there. When you're developing a vertical component, you shouldn't care whether or not uh, tags are on, uh, installed on the system because the tagging component should actually be completely transparent to you. Um, the opposite would be kind of nice as well, but it's less likely that that's going to happen. Uh, so the tag component will probably have to be aware to some degree of uh, the structure of uh, the vertical components. But we're not entirely sure just how much decoupling we can actually achieve there. Um, so this, this idea of having horizontal and vertical components leads on to uh, um, what, we're, what we're terming uh, the orthogonal architecture. Orthogonal means at right angles. Um, which leads me on to this chap. Anybody know who, know who this one is? Any guesses? No? This is actually Pythagoras. Um, uh, he's, uh, this is from a painting in, um, uh, by Raphael, the School of Athens, very famous painting, um, which is why we're actually calling the, the, the repository. We've, got a, we've given it a code name. We call it Pythagoras. And it's from the orthogonal um, idea there. So just a bit of fun there. Um, so one of the things we want to try to do here is to isolate the components from their environment. Um, so that when you're writing component code, you don't need to be concerned with what kind of input you're getting and what kind of output you're producing. You should be isolated from the inputs and outputs. Um, so on the input side, this, uh, this means really that uh, you, you've got browser uh, interfaces, you've got CLI interfaces, which is the command line. You can take input from uh, other sources as well. Uh, so for example, uh, co-app if you're into Internet of Things type things. Uh, or if you're in the enterprise environment, you should be able to take input from message queues. Uh, and the component code doesn't need to know any of that stuff. It will just take the, 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 the input from wherever it comes from. And similarly, on the output side, we want the output to be independent of uh, the output channels that we're using. Uh, and to do that, uh, we want to build this media-independent content tree. So uh, this, this isolates, again, the component code. The component doesn't need to know about the, this tree structure. It just outputs the, uh, what, it, what it needs to output, and that gets put into, inserted into this content tree, uh, which is then subsequently rendered. Um, and that rendering process, the serialization of that content tree into a stream of bytes, is, takes place under the control of the template and the layouts. Now, ideally, we want the, the templates and layouts that are currently in use to carry on being used without actually be, having to be altered. I'm not entirely sure how much change there is likely to be there. Um, but ideally, we want to at least be, be backwards compatible on the templates at any rate, so you, your template doesn't need to change. Uh, and all this, this content tree stuff kind of happens underneath the hood. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we don't want any restrictions on the output format. Um, so that we can output anything you like. So HTML is obviously what we mostly produce. Uh, XML and JSON, you can, you can do that. And in actual fact, on the, uh, to, to do the API kind of stuff, uh, your RESTful API type stuff, you will probably not use quite this same uh, mechanism. So instead of going through the template process, we go through profiles instead. But again, the, the point is here, though, that it doesn't matter to the component. The component doesn't care where the output is going. It just produces its output. The rest of the rendering process and so forth uh, takes place elsewhere. So that's the high-level uh, picture of, uh, of what we want uh, Joomla 4 to, to look like. Now uh, let's go a little deeper into that. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Model View Controller. Any, uh, anybody, uh, anybody not familiar with Model View uh, MVC? <laughs> Those trick questions. <laughs> Uh, so the MVC structure is uh, basically looks like that. We have these MVC triads, um, and the FC on the, on the left there is uh, is a front controller. So typically your index.php is your front controller, um, plus other stuff as well. Uh, but the function of that front controller ultimately is to route the request through to the MB the appropriate MVC triad, the appropriate component that you want. Uh, so MVC, uh, very briefly. Uh, the, the controller deals with the input, the view deals with the output, and the model deals with everything else in between. So in terms of what we're thinking of for Joomla 4, 
let's take these in turn. Let's look at the controller first. So the controller needs to handle the input requests. Uh, typically, you're going to manipulate the model in some way, whatever the model is. It might not necessarily be a code that's actually running within Joomla. It could be you push it out to another system or whatever. It doesn't really matter. The controller shouldn't actually care where the model is or how the model does its stuff. Uh, and it configures the view. And in terms of Joomla 4, what we want to do is to replace or to in enhance that controller really with by introducing a command bus. Uh, anybody familiar with the command bus pattern? Okay, you guys have got some learning to do. <laughs> it's, don't worry, it's fun, actually. It, it is really in re interesting stuff. Um, so I'll briefly run through it anyway. Uh, we, we've got the three elements. We've got command, we've got a command bus, and we've got command handlers. So a command is just a very, very simple object. It has almost no behavior on, on its own. It's just like a wrapper for, for, for information. Uh, it's immutable, so once you've created it, you can't change it. It doesn't have any setters. Uh, it, it, ha it potentially has getters, but it doesn't have any setters. Um, and it's a value object. Anybody familiar with the value objects? Yeah, one, one or two people, right. So the idea of a value object is that uh, two objects can ha will have the same value, um, are, are effectively treated as though they're being the same thing. So uh, the, the classic example is if, uh, is if I got say two 500 rupee note, notes, right? They're, they're two distinct notes, but they actually have the same value. So they're treated effectively as the same thing within, within the system. So these commands are value objects. They're, if you have, you can have multiple commands, but if they, they can have the same value, so you, can, you treat them as being the same. And uh, one of the nice things about doing it this way is that we can actually encapsulate the validation logic for those commands in the constructors. So it's, it makes it impossible to actually create an invalid command because the constructor will just throw an exception if you try to do that. Uh, so we can shuffle commands around the system. If you've got a command, you know it must, by definition, be a valid command. Now, fair enough, not all the validation logic can actually put it, be put in the constructor. Some of the more advanced rules that you might apply to it have to be put elsewhere. But at least you've got that kind of first line of defense, really, that the simple validation can take place actually in the, in the command itself. And one of the nice things about commands, particularly for the enter enterprise environment, is that you can actually serialize them, and you can put them on message queues. You can transmit them from one place to another. So instead of having uh, like a single monolithic Joomla application, you can actually have a Joomla application which uh, initially captures com or creates commands and then pushes them off to some other system where they actually get executed. So having created your commands, you then drop them onto a command bus. And the command bus, the purpose of the command bus is to really just route uh, those commands to an appropriate handler to figure out which, which handler is going to handle that command. And there is only one handler for each command. Um, and the reason why we want to do that is because we can actually decorate that command bus. We can wrap it with uh, additional code. So effectively, every command going through the system is going to go through the command bus, and that gives us a, a way in which we can uh, have a common point at which we can wrap uh, the handling of those commands. Um, and this, in fact, is the way in which we will handle the integration between the vertical components and the horizontal components. Um, so the, one of those wrappers, uh, it's often referred to as middleware, will have the integration between the horizontals and verticals there. And we can actually do other things with these, with these wrappers, like, for example, if you want to log every single command that's going through the system, you can put a, a, a logging wrapper around the command bus and it just logs everything that's going through. Um, and uh, we haven't made a final decision on this, but, but the, there's a very good chance that we will probably take uh, a package called Tactician, uh, which is a command bus pa uh, package. So we don't have to develop our own command bus, we just pull one out of the, uh, off the interwebs there. Uh, this one comes from the, the League of uh, Exceptional Packages, is I think it's called, something like that. It's, uh, it's a pretty good thing, pretty well respected anyway. So. And uh, the final part of that command bus uh, pattern is that you have a command handler which actually executes that, that particular command. Usually these are going to be very small classes, very few lines of code in them. Um, and these are generally where you make calls into the model. So in the past, you've had the controller handling uh, calls out to the model. 
now effectively we're going to put those calls to the model in these command handlers instead. And most of the logic that is actually in those, uh, those classes, these command handler classes, will be uh, what, what we refer to as orchestration logic. So it's just, you're just orchestrating things. You're not actually doing anything particularly within the, uh, within the model, within the, within the application. You're just coordinating uh, events that take place. And just a little thing here, uh, one of the things you can do in the command handles, you can actually type in the command names, um, which means really that, that I said before that uh, every command has one and exactly one command handler that, that handles that command. Um, in order to make sure that connection takes place properly, we can type in the command name there as well. So you can't get it wrong, really. You can't have a command handler handling the wrong kind of command. Um, and it also makes the code a little easier to read as well. So those three elements uh, together with uh, a couple of other things form um, a layer. And we like layers. We like layers in software, don't we? Especially when we have jam in them. Um, and this one's called the service layer. And if you look it up in the architecture textbooks around the, around the place, you'll usually refer, see it referred to as a service layer. Sometimes it's called an application layer or something. There's a, a few other terms for it. But effectively, we're talking about a service layer here. And uh, Part of uh, what we're trying to achieve here with, with the transition to Joomla 4, the migration to, uh, to Joomla 4, is to make that migration path easier uh, between 3 and 4. So it's, uh, it occurred to us actually that we can actually backport the, the service layer from Joomla 4 back into Joomla 3 um, because it's an optional extra. You don't have to use it, but we can actually put it, I'm planning to actually put it into, into the Joomla 3.6 release. So you'll get early access to, to some of this code. You can start refactoring some of your components if you want to do that to actually make use of the service layer. And it will still work in Joomla 3. Then when you come to Joomla 4, you haven't got so much refactoring to do because uh, you've already got you know, some of the code working already. So that was a controller. Let's uh, turn our attention now to the view. Um, and. Uh, the big change in the view is uh, that we're going to introduce this rendering idea. Uh, Marco touched on it. I've, I've referred to it a little earlier as well, uh, where we're taking uh, the content tree, which is the CT there, uh, and turning that into a stream of bytes. So the, the, the STR there is, is short for stream. And this has to be done in, in um, coordination with the template. The template coordinates this, this activity. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite a complicated dance. We're not entirely sure of all the details yet. We're still trying to experiment and figure out uh, exactly the right way to do this. Uh, but the attention, as I said before, is to try and retain backwards compatibility with the existing templates, but also at the same time to give you the, the, the capability that you can actually produce much more sophisticated kinds of, of output. So uh, just a few words about the renderer. Uh, as I said, it takes the output agnostic content tree and serializes it to a stream of bytes. There needs to be uh, one renderer per content type. Um, you can have variations on that. So the template can say, I want a slightly different renderer for this particular content type. But effectively, a content type request will get routed to a particular renderer. And again, there are, there are kind of standard packages available to actually do that content negotiation uh, part. Uh, and it's likely, again, not decided, but it's likely that we will take this package uh, by Will Durand called negotiation. Um, again, I'm going to try and put that into uh, 3.6 as well. Um, and that really just takes care of the, the content negotiation issues uh, that we have. It makes sure it's, it's compatible with all the, the RFCs and so forth on on handling the accept header. Um, so it, can, it passes that correctly and, and works out what renderer you actually need in, in each particular case. Uh, and it goes beyond content type as well. The negotiation package will actually negotiate uh, character sets and encodings and, and other stuff as well. And ultimately, that rendering uh, process is, takes place according to a, a, the thing called a visitor pattern. Uh, that's probably. Fairly new to most of you. If, I don't know if, who's, who's familiar with the, the Gang of Four uh, patterns. Yeah, there's a few hands going out there. Um, this, is, this is one of those patterns. It's not often used. Um, it's actually quite a complicated pattern because it involves this double interaction. 
Um, but we think that's probably the most appropriate way in which we can uh, actually handle that rendering process. Um, and this is one of the, the issues here is actually with the existing template structure is to make sure that we're, we can still do that in a double indirection environment without confusing the heck out of everybody and, and making it really hard to actually do these things. It may be that we simplify some things along the line uh, somewhere. I've actually started using this on the, uh, the 3.6 code for the API uh, stuff, and it turns out on the API stuff is much, much simpler because you have a very clearly defined structure to the data, and you can actually get rid of one of those levels of indirection, and you don't need to use the visitor pattern on that side. But for the, for the more complex uh, rendering on the HTML side, we'll probably need to use the visitor pattern. So next, let's look at the, uh, the model next. Now, who's, who's heard of uh, domain-driven design? That's a few hands. That's, that's, that's more than I was expecting, actually. I wasn't expecting anyone to put their hands up at all. <laughs> um, so I thoroughly recommend that you start looking at domain-driven design, because it is really, really uh, an important thing that's coming up now. Uh, it's getting um, uh, more and more accepted as, uh, as a better way to design and build software. And some of the ideas from DDD uh, we are trying to build into, into Joomla 4. Uh, this is the, uh, the classic book that everybody should read. Um, so I'm not going to say too much about DDD because it's such a big subject, uh, but by all means, if, if you're interested, come and talk to me afterwards. These are some of the terms that you'll probably hear bandied about in relation to DDD. So we have a ubiquitous language within a bounded context. Probably doesn't mean anything to you. I've touched on, touched on the, uh, the idea of value objects, which are actually very important in DDD. But we also have entities and aggregates. And repositories and factories. I'll talk about repositories in a second. Uh, and domain events, which is actually uh, one, of the, one of the key concepts as well uh, within DDD. Um, and uh, really, the message I want to get over is please learn this stuff, because this is, uh, it, it's going to be really, really important. And it's also going to help you build better software in, in the Joomla environment. If you read the Eric Evans book, the original one, and you want to learn more about DDD, read this one as well. Uh, this actually was written much later than the Eric Evans book, and it includes some more stuff that Evans didn't, uh, didn't either get around to or, or wasn't clearly understood at the time. So you find that Evans doesn't actually refer very much to domain events, whereas this book goes much, more, much deeper into those. So read the two. If you, if you can't afford the books because they're quite expensive, then there is stuff online, so you can, you can learn the material as well that way. And by all means, drop me a line if you're interested in, uh, you know, if you've got questions or anything about DDD. I'm still learning it myself, uh, you know, I, but I, I've, I've, it's transformed the way that I think about and, and, and write software over the past year or so. Uh, and I thoroughly recommend that you, uh, you follow that, that course. So one of the, uh, one of the uh, concepts that comes out in DDD is that there's two kinds of logic within the system. Uh, one of those is domain logic, which is really the core of what the, what the business is about, the core of what your component does. Uh, it's the, uh, the concepts of the business. It's, it's the business rules. Uh, and ideally, we want to separate those out so that they are in one particular place and we don't clutter up the model with, uh, with stuff that isn't uh, the core of that business, the core of what the component does. Um, and everything else that isn't domain logic is basically application logic. It's infrastructural type stuff. It's uh, stuff where you're, you're coordinating tasks. Uh, you're doing things like uh, sending out notification emails. You know, that's not the core of what your component does. But it's logic that still needs to happen somewhere within the system. And we want to separate that logic out into a, into a slightly different place. So. In terms of Joomla 4, we want the domain logic really to, to be what is in those models. So we're stripping out anything which isn't uh, domain logic uh, into mostly into the service layer. So the application logic will move to the service layer. Some of it goes in el elsewhere as well. So your uh, domain events, for example, will go to domain event handlers. And those handlers technically don't really belong in the service layer. But that's probably uh, picking hairs a bit. Um, so the model then, um, well, actually, one other thing we want to do is to eliminate uh, this inheritance hierarchy that currently exists within Joomla. 
So at the moment, you, you've got things like uh, JModel admin inherits from JModel list, which inherits from JModel legacy or something. I forget exactly what the thing is. That hierarchy just shouldn't exist. We shouldn't be doing that kind of inheritance. We really want to be favoring composition over inheritance. Um, so we'll be flattening that hierarchy out completely. You'll, there'll only be at most one level of inheritance really within the model structure. So you'll have a, maybe a JModel base. I mean, we'll probably change the names, but effectively, it's a base class which just doesn't do very, very much in actual fact. And you'll just be inheriting from that uh, one single class. And the models should really only contain domain logic, as I've said before. Uh, and they will optionally raise domain events. So, uh, for example, if we have a system in which we're registering customers, uh, then a command might come into the system which says uh, register customer, like so it might, might be called register customer. Uh, this is routed to a command handler. The command handler call, make, call, makes calls out to the model, which actually does the physical registration of that customer, i.e. You know, creates a, a record in the database. Um, and then having done that, that core business function, it then raises a domain event, which might be called customer was registered, for example. And then uh, the service layer then will take care of publishing those domain events to Whoever listen, whoever's listening, whoever is interested, whatever part of the software system is interested in that event occurring, um, will will listen into that domain event, uh, and that might be um, sending out a notification email. For example, it will it will just be a listener for that domain event. If I want to, if my customer comes along and says, uh, "Oh, I, whenever a register, whenever a customer gets registered, I want to send them a voucher," for example, then I, all I got to do is write a little plugin which listens to that domain event, red, domain event occurring, and all it's got to do is then generate that email. And I haven't got to touch the domain logic at all. I haven't got to touch, the, even, I haven't touched the component. It can be somebody else's component entirely. And I can still add, these func add this functionality to these, uh, these components very easily. So um, another thing we want to do with the model is to separate out the domain management aspects of the model, the data access, um, sorry, the data access um, uh, responsibilities of, the, of what is currently in the model to separate those out into uh, repositories. So that the model actually doesn't need to care about where stuff is stored. It doesn't, uh, it's not, it doesn't have any dependencies on the database at all. Uh, and the repository pattern is, is something, again, from uh, a domain-driven design. Uh, I think it's used elsewhere as well, but d certainly it's in DDD. Um, and the repository can make use of uh, things like finders and validators and persisters and stuff like that. Uh, we're still not entirely uh, clear on exactly how that repository is, is going to be structured and how it's going to work, but it's, it's coming together nicely at the moment. And I should say something about uh, database abstraction. Um, I think Marco alluded to it this morning that uh, currently we in theory, we can run Joomla on multiple different platforms, including uh, Microsoft SQL and Postgres and things like that. In practice, if you're not running MySQL, it's probably not going to work very well. Um, and the reason for that is that there hasn't really been that many people interested in maintaining the, the drivers, the code, the adapters for these other databases. So the quality in, is, is not really there. In theory, it works. In practice, there's problems. Um, it's obviously not something that is um, uh, really something that we should be getting into. We don't have the number of people really interested in maintaining this code uh, for us to continue doing that. So what we're thinking of doing is uh, to adopt someone else's database abstraction level. And the chances are we will almost certainly adopt uh, the Doctrine DBAL uh, to do that. Um, which is not to be confused with Doctrine ORM, which is a, which is a different thing entirely. Uh, and that will enable us, basically, for Joomla 4, we can actually then say, yes, it will run on Microsoft SQL, because we haven't written the drivers for it. We, 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 all we have to do is to write the, the high-level abstract code, uh, and we know it's going to work on, those, on the, uh, these other environments. Um, and just so as not to scare anybody, uh, Doctrine DBL is actually very, very close to what we're already doing with JDatabase Query. There's actually very little difference between them. We're, we're almost there. Um, and I think what we'll probably do is, for Joomla 4, we will uh, support both Doctrine, Doctrine DBL and JDatabase Query. 
uh, but we'll deprecate JDatabase query in Joomla 4 and remove it in Joomla 5. So you'll have a period of time in which to just make that, those small changes that you need to adapt to the Doctor and Debel uh, environment instead. Uh, and basically that's uh, the sort of diagram you end up with, which looks pretty complicated. There's a lot of moving parts in there. Um, but the good news is, in actual fact, most of those parts you don't need to worry about because the Joomla core is going to, to deal with a lot of that logic and a lot of that, uh, that functionality. So in actual fact, the, the, what the component itself needs to deal with is actually sh shrunk down. You actually need to write less code in order to do what you need to do because the, Joom the Joomla core is going to take over a lot of uh, uh, the responsibilities that you've previously had. So, how's that sounding so far? Is that, is that making sense to everybody? There's a, a few people are nodding their heads. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Right. Um, so, what I, I wanted to uh, finish up just by talking about a couple of uh, topics which I think are very interesting. One is uh, we will uh, we'll definitely adopt uh, the other one we probably won't, but I'll come to why in a second. So the first one is uh, this one, CQRS, um, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Marco uh, mentioned it briefly this morning. Uh, and this is uh, really based on the idea of command query separation, uh, in which uh, the idea is that there's, there's something fundamentally different between commands and queries. This dates back to the original ideas of object orientation, where uh, uh, commands can update uh, the state of a system or the state of a, an object, but they don't produce any output. Whereas on the other hand, queries uh, don't change the state of anything, but they do produce output. And you actually should have them separated and they should be different things. And this in CQRS is taken uh, even further because you actually have separate models. So you have a separate write model and a separate from, which is separate from the read model. So uh, on the command side, uh, as I said, they change model state, but they don't produce any output. You have a success or failure, that's about the limit. Uh, and, and ideally, if it fails, you would throw an exception. Um, and one of the things that we want to build into Joomla 4 is that though on the command side, commands are executed strictly in sequence. So you can't have commands executing within other commands. Uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if a command uh, fires off other commands, which is, uh, which is per perfectly possible, those commands don't execute immediately. They're queued up effectively until the, the, the primary command finishes. And there's some technical reasons why that should happen. It's, uh, it just makes the software more stable and uh, more understandable. That's a technicality, though. You probably don't need to uh, worry too much about it. Um, on the query side, on the other hand, queries don't change model state. Uh, so they're perfectly safe to fire off any number of queries you want at the system. Um, but they do, of course, produce output. And in contrast to commands, we actually do want the queries to execute hierarchically. Uh, and this gives us uh, effectively hierarchical MVC. Uh, and it's the basis on which we build those content trees. So uh, we, we can build the content tree dynamically. Um, even, even with a single call, you can actually hierarchically call other models within the system or other um, software components within the system and build that tree dynamically in a hierarchical way. So the benefits of, of CQRE, um, as I've mentioned, the read and write models can be different. Um, therefore, they can actually be optimized separately. And the classic example of this is that uh, on the write side, we can write data to uh, a classical uh, relational database management system. So things like MySQL, for example, we can write the data into uh, MySQL, but on the read side, we would read it from uh, a NoSQL database or, or just a denormalized view of a relational database. And the advantage of doing that is that the, on the read side, it's going to be a lot faster uh, when you get up to, to large scale systems. Uh, obviously, for, for a 10 page website, it is going to make a blind bit of difference. <laughs> you just won't notice it. Uh, but if you're talking about uh, 10,000 pages, then you should notice a, a significant improvement in performance on the read side. But no difference on the write side. So it's, it's a win on that, in that sense. The drawbacks are, is, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, by default, of course, you just don't need to worry about this. You, you just use the same database for reads and writes, same models. 
Uh, so there's no additional complexity there. Uh, but if, you, if you're uh, a developer that's, that's likely to get into an environment where you're going to need to scale these things out, then you have naturally a, a, an easy way in which you can uh, create these separate models uh, and allow the, the, the application to scale. Another drawback is uh, most developers aren't familiar with it. Uh, so there's a little bit of learning there to actually, uh, to actually work with it. But probably the biggest drawback is that the read models are actually only eventually consistent. Right? There is a, for a very short period of time, there is, a, there is going to be a difference between the right model and the read model. The read model is going to have to catch up with the, with the right model. Of course, again, in mo the vast majority of cases, that doesn't really make any difference. You won't notice it. Uh, but it is something that you need to be aware of if you're going to scale systems up uh, to, to, to realize that these read models uh, are not atomically consistent. They are only eventually consistent. So uh, the reason for doing CQRS, of course, is to make it easier to scale. And I've hit the wrong button. There we go. Try that one. Um, but as I said, most applications don't actually need it. But it's there. It's really for the, the enterprise environment as much as anything. But Jimmerful will be able to support CQRS right out of the box. Now, if you Google for CQRS, you'll almost certainly come across this term, which is uh, event sourcing. Anybody come across event sourcing already? Nobody. That's like, is that, oh, one person. <laughs> one person. I wasn't expecting anybody to, to put their hand up there. Um, so the idea of event sourcing is that effectively all events and commands going through the, all commands going through the system um, are recorded in an append-only log. So it's an immutable log, um, which we refer to as the event source, uh, and that is the, the the point of reference. That is that is the definitive location of what happened throughout the entire system. And then everything you need to do as far as the domain models are concerned are just projections off of that event source. Uh, so if you're uh, building um, uh, a screen with, with data in it, uh, you're actually just reading data from the, the event source. Now, in order to, to maintain the performance, you're probably caching that data. But effectively, you're, you're what we currently refer to as the, uh, uh, as the database, uh, the, you know, the MySQL databases that we currently use. Uh, really, those, those are just cached projections of the event source. Um, and I, I'm not going to go deep into this for reasons that, you'll, that will become apparent in just a second. Uh, but it has some advantages. You can do some really clever things with this. Uh, you can reconstruct, because you have a complete history of the entire system for, for going back to, well, beginning of time if you want uh, to keep it that long. Uh, you have a full version history and you can actually backtrack and reconstruct what the system was like a year ago if you want. Uh, you, don't, you never lose any data. Um, so, uh, unless you deliberately sort of put a cutoff point within it. Um, which is great for analytics because you, you, can, you can effectively analyze what the system did over a very long period of time. And you can do clever things like running what-if scenarios. So if you would decide, uh, I wonder what would have happened if, if I changed the model to, to work like this. Because you've got a ver full version history, you can just run all those events through your new model, and that will tell you what the state of the system would be like if you ran with that new model. So you can do really sorts of cool stuff with that. Like that, with that. However, um, we're almost certainly not going to implement this in Joomla 4, right? It is probably too big a shift for most people. I think it's going to change. It changes the way in which you think about building the software. Um, and I don't think the vast majority of developers are probably really ready for that yet. I'm not sure I'm ready for it, to be honest. I've never tried it before. Um, so although technically it should be possible with Joomla 4, we're certainly not going to prevent anybody from doing this in Joomla 4. Um, uh, it's not needed in all cases. It's probably more um, for uh, enterprise-type environments anyway. Um, and initially, we're just not going to put it into Joomla 4. We're not going to refactor the, the core components to use event sourcing at all. Um, but maybe 4.3, 4.7 or something, maybe we'll do. Or maybe it'll be wait, Joomla 5. I don't know. But certainly, we're, we're not intending to actually build this into Joomla 4. So I put that in just to eliminate it. <laughs> So, quick summary. Um, the orthogonal architecture, as I've mentioned, this horizontal and vertical components. Uh, w the addition of, an, uh, of a new service layer, which we're going to backport into Joomla 3. Uh, the idea of these renderers and the content tree, uh, but trying to maintain compatibility with the, with the templates. Um, 
repositories and moving the data access out of the models and into uh, its own um, layer effectively. Uh, the introduction of these concepts from domain-driven design. CQRS, and the one that should actually have a line through it but seems to have disappeared, is uh, event sourcing. Uh, the big question, of course, is will it work? <laughs> Um, and I'll leave, I'll leave you with this quote uh, from Linus. Um, theory and practice sometimes clash, and when that happens, theory loses every single time. Um, so, yeah, th this is all wonderful in theory. Uh, we have a great time putting this stuff together. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we will have no, uh, no, no qualms about uh, ditching parts of the theory if, if in practice it doesn't actually work. And we'll just make the essential thing is that we make it work. Joomla 4 must work. Uh, whether that's uh, 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 theoretically pure or not. So, I think we have uh, a little time for questions, perhaps, or, uh, or not? Can we the question? That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> a very good question indeed. Um, so, the, the, uh, the plan is uh, vaguely, at any rate, uh, the Joomla and Beyond, the Gem Beyond uh, event next year in May. Uh, we would like to put an alpha release out. Um, soon before that, at any rate, um, which will be like a te technology demonstration uh, with all these concepts in it, uh, so that you can, you can get your hands on it, you can kick it around, and you can figure out what works, what doesn't work. Um, beta releases, we, d we haven't set a date for it. Can we make some development uh, ideas? Sorry, I'm, I'm with you. For the for the architecture or, or, or whatever, no, no, no. for the design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By all means, uh, the the person to contact is actually Marco because he's the 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 leader for the Joomla four project. So yeah, by all means, get in touch with him. Yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> sort of. Did Did you want to ask the follow up? Though? No. You want to suggest some ideas? Yeah. 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 We're open to ideas. Please. Absolutely. Yeah, please, get in touch with Marco, and he'll uh, route you to the right place to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes? I think so. It's not going to be a changes about component modules, plugins, and plates. It's going to be the same idea. Yes. It's going to be only an internal architecture. Yes. Um, uh, as far as the, the, like the user interface is concerned, uh, you don't need to worry about any of this stuff. It does, is that what you were asking? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Look me afterwards anyway. If, if I haven't answered that question properly. Why not be? Why not be? Well, the, we probably will use an ORM. Actually, the big question is, do we use our own ORM, or whether do we use, adopt Doctrine, or do we adopt something else? Um, but we probably will have some sort of ORM into the system there somewhere. Yeah. Do we have to write that? It's a, it's a very good question, and it's a question we're still working through the answer to that, actually. That's, that's an ongoing issue. It's an ongoing uh, question we're trying to resolve internally. Yes, yes. There's, lo there's lots of ideas around, and Nicholas has contributed to the Duke 4 architecture as well. So we're, we're, this, is, this is still an ongoing discussion as to exactly how we're going to do But I think there will definitely be some kind of ORM concept within the system, whether we take somebody else's, whether we do our own or, or a mixture or something, I don't know, but there will be definitely be something in there. Yes, yes. It's, it's definitely a good idea. There definitely needs to be some way in which we can um, move uh, models from, uh, from the database into, into the object environment, into the domain model and do that nice and cleanly. And the ORM isn't actually a, the, the way to do that. Yeah, well, the database abstraction we've taken care of with the DBAL, but uh, the ORM is, is sort of at a higher level than that, yeah. Okay, sorry. If there are any more questions, I'm, I'm around for the next several days, so please uh, 
uh, find me and, and ask those questions. Thank you very much.